classes in these lectures and lab about the upper respiratory tract. So the first lecture most of the time goes towards the inflammatory disorders. Then we go towards the neoplastic disorders. So among the inflammatory disorders of the upper respiratory tract, what are these? So these will be the objectives. Allergic rhinitis, sinusitis, pharyngitis, tonsillitis, so all these things we will cover. Now, the most common thing that we have is the common thing. Sudden change in temperature, going from AC to warm climate, you will have these things. Like, what are the symptoms and signs of common cold? <laughs> Most of the time, it is not like fever is not there most of the time, and cough is also not there most of the time. Common cold, runny nose. It is like sneezing, running nose, nasal discharge, nasal stuffiness. These are the common symptoms. But fever can be there. Mostly it occurs in children. If they have a common cold, they will have fever also. So like this. So acute infections of the upper respiratory tract, they are one of the most common infections in the human beings. One of the most common. And most common manifestation is the common cold, which I told you, which you told me. Like sneezing, uh, then running nose, stuffiness of the nose. Uh, these are the most common symptoms. Etiology, most of the common viruses, mostly it is caused by viruses. Because when you have common cold, most of the time you go to the doctor, they, what they told you, tell you. It is because of the viral infection, it will subside on its own. Huh? After one, two, three days, it goes off its own. No need to take anything. Hmm? So the most common pathogen is the rhino. Rhino means the nose. Rhino refers to the nose. So the most common viruses are the rhino viruses. Okay? Rhino viruses. Other viruses can be responsible like respiratory syncytia virus or coronavirus, influenza viruses, adenoviruses, enteroviruses and sometimes the bacteria can also be involved in the common cold. We are talking about the common cold like beta hemolytic streptococcus. And in 40% of the cases still we do not know the cause, 40% of the cases. But mostly it is viral, maybe the new viruses you will discover in future. And these are the common symptoms and signs, nasal congestion, watery discharge, sneezing, scratchy, dry throat, and slight increase in temperature, especially in cases of children. And most of these infections occur during the fall and winter seasons. Fall and winter season, and usually they will last for a week or even less than that. This is the common thing which you will have. But nowadays, we can have these during the summer months also. Like you, your AC is on. So you are changing the temperature. Huh? Change in the temperature, you will have the common. Huh? So this is the reason. Previously, mostly in fall and winter. But now, the things are changing. Because, you know, our living habits are changing. And complications can occur. If these things are prolonged, the immunity is less. The person is not that much having good immunity. So these things can progress and involve the ear, what I its median, or it can go and involve the pharyngitis, it can cause pharyngitis or it can cause sinusitis. From the nose it can spread to the surrounding surface. But this is less common. Less common. Most of the time it will subside on its own. On its own means without taking any medicine. So if you have severe symptoms, look, you can take some antihistamines for some time. Antihistamines. Or if you have slight fever, take paracetamol. If it goes on, then you can think of taking the antibiotics. So don't make it a routine to take the antibiotics on first sleep. And antibiotics. No, no. This is very bad. Because this is causing the antibiotic resistance from the organism. And you have the superbugs, which cannot be treated by anything. We have the flesh eating bacteria nowadays. So I was, uh, you know, going for the new news, the latest news regarding these things, like flesh-eating bacteria. There was one person who was infected, and his whole have to be amputated. You have the super bugs, which cannot be treated by anything. No antibiotics work. 
Even the latest antivirus don't work. When the person dies, you cannot treat him. Why? Because we have made these bacteria. We give antibiotics and ultimately what happens? These bacteria develop resistance. They have that capacity. God has given them that capacity. So they develop resistance, new bacteria come. So you should avoid the use of these antibiotics. I am saying this because you will be using it in your families, in your surroundings. So avoid using these. Norinites, coming specifically. This was common cold we discussed. You know everything, the most common cold and organic is the rhinovirus. Now coming to the rhinites. Rhinites means inflammation of the nose. It can be acute, it can be chronic. Acute can be a part of common cold. It can be part of flu. Flu caused by the influenza virus mostly. It can be, you know, we can call it by the name coriza or acute catarrh. Means inflammation of the mucous membrane of the nose. Then chronic can be specific or non-specific. Specific when you know the organism. Like tuberculosis, syphilis, secleroma, leprosy, sargadosis. Huh? These are the chronic. Non-specific when you don't know the organism and it can be of various types. Simple. Hypertrophy, when there is hypertrophy of the mucosa and atrophy, when there will be atrophy of the mucosa. It is simple. Simple, there will be no change in the mucosa. Hypertrophy, hypertrophy and atrophy, it means there will be atrophy of the <coughs> mucosal, mucosal cells. Is it clear? So, rhinites can be acute, it can be chronic. Now, what can be the cause? You know, nose is continuously exposed to the outside air. Yes, everything. So whenever the predisposing factors for acute inflammation of the nasal mucous membrane is like exposure to the cold, sudden exposure to the cold, sudden exposure to the dust, exposure to some antigens, droughts of air, fast air, sandstorms are there. So this can cause the inflammation of the nasal membrane. So these are the predisposing factors. Cold, droughts of air, dust, then change in the sudden change in the temperature which you will be exposed nowadays. What is the pathogenesis? All these factors, they can cause vasoconstriction in the nasal mucous membrane. When there is vasoconstriction, the blood flow will be reduced. So there will be ischemia like condition. When ischemia is there, the mucous membrane will be damaged. Sometimes, because of the air is very strong, strongly coming and entering the nose, it can damage the cilia. So mechanical forces can even damage the cilia. So all these things will cause the inflammation of the so vasoconstriction, leading to ischemia-like condition and destruction of the cilia. So this will cause this is the pathogens why the inflammation occurs. So whenever there is you know ischemia-like condition, the inflammation will come to the nose. Whenever there is destruction of the cilia, the inflammation will come for causing the repair. But then you will have the symptoms because of the inflammation. Inflammation comes to cause the repair of the mucous membrane, but then you will have the symptoms because inflammatory cells will come, they will release their mucus. You got it. The causes and times. Rhinites can be caused by, as we said, many organisms are there. Many, many organisms are there, like the common cold. Mostly we have the viruses. So when you have a viral infection, it will lead to watery discharge from the nose. But if you have the Bacteria as the cause, it will cause purulent discharge. Purulent discharge. Okay? Yellowish purulent. It will be thick, it will be thick, pus like. Then if you have the allergy, so in the allergy you will have sneezing, too much sneezing, profuse watery discharge, more than the viral. Okay? More than the viral. And characters of all these, mostly these have a seasonal incidence. Like Towards when the cold climate is there, or pollen climate, no it is. We have the pollen climate, pollens are there, flowers are there. So many of the people will have allergic this time. So this, some people have during the cold because of the viruses. So viral season. Because of cold, but because of allergy of the cold. So different things are there. So it mostly has a seasonal incidence. Most of the time it also heals spontaneously. Without treatment. Without no need of treatment, it heals spontaneously. But if a person is having watery discharge, after a few days from the watery discharge, it goes to purulent. It means superimposed bacterial infection. 
then you have to treat. Then you have to give the antibody. Otherwise, you wait. You wait. You have many things at home which you can use. Like, you can use the gargles. You can use steel. These are the good things. Steel, steel, steel. Huh? What if steel, gargles, saline gargles. If these things do no, don't work, then you can go for the other things like antibodies. Uh, if the wind, uh, Flu can look flu if we take flu. Flu has many causes, like influenza virus, you have, you have the MERS virus, you have the avian flu. No? So it is a part of that. The rhinitis is a part of that. What is it? It's a part of that. Flu has many symptoms. It has malaise, fatigue, other symptoms regarding to the upper respiratory tract with rhinitis as a teacher. There are three causes, allergy, bacterial and viral. So these three things are different. But viral can be superimposed by the bacteria. But it is not similar, I will tell you how. How you will differentiate. If a person is having allergy, he will have too much of sneezing. And it will be, you know, continuous. Like this, huh? four, five, six. Huh? Continuous sneezing. And Refuse watery discharge. It will be not that light of fire. And if you go by you know various tests, you will do they will be present in eosinophils in allergies. It will not be in the viral infection. Huh? And many of the people who have allergies have polyps in the nose, not in the viral infection. Huh? So these are the differences which we are coming. These you know fast. So this. First we will see this one. So this. Clear yeah, with the presence of eosinophilia, marked fluid discharge, marked edema. So everything will be more than poly formation. So this is how you differentiate. And these are the pictures. So if you take the, this is from the you know nasal polyp. So this is the polyp, and you will have the presence of eosinophils in this. So if you have the eosinophils, it means it is the allergic yeah. polyp. It is an allergic polyp, and most of the people with allergies have the nasal polyps. Now, complications. What are the complications of? Oh, nice. What kind of thing the allergic patient? Antihistamine. So what's the allergic? Antihistamines. You have the antihistamines like like. Heparin is not. Antihistamines. What do you take for allergy? Cetrazine. You take the cetrazine, chlorpenilamine, like avian tablets. You take you take the cetrazines. Huh? So many loratidine is here, which is more specific, which doesn't cause the sedation. We have the levocetrazine, which doesn't cause much sedation. But cetrazine will cause, avian will cause. Huh? So these are the antihistamines, they will reduce the amount. But if you want a prophylactic thing, prophylactic is mast cell stabilizer. So you give, allergy season is approaching. So before two, three weeks you will start, not two, three, two, three months, you will start a drug which is called Morticulast. Morticulast. Okay? In MOIG it comes as new cast, 10 milligrams. So you will start this, it will stabilize the, we are from the, Mediators are released. They are released from the mast cells. So it will stabilize the mast cells. So the mediators will not be released. But cetrazine and other antihistamines will work when the mediators have already been released. Isn't it? They are antihistamines. So if you want the stabilization of the mast cells, you don't want the mediators to be released, you give the mast cell stabilizers. Or if the symptoms are already there, then antihistamines. This is how you control it. And these, it can spread to various various things, right? It can go to the sinuses, na? cause sinusitis, to the pharynx, causing nasopharyngitis, otitis media, tonsillitis, then it can go down, laryngitis, acute pneumonia. So, you know, sometimes a person has first upper respiratory tract, then he falls, here is cough also, and many things, sputum also coming. So, it means there is involvement of the lower respiratory tract. So, you have to be careful. If 
the upper respiratory tract infections are prolonged, they can involve the lower respiratory tract. And even the pneumonia can occur because of that. So these are the complications. Now the chronic non-specific rhinitis. So we discussed the acute rhinitis. It is finished. Chronic non-specific, which remains for a longer period. So again, acute and acute attacks again and again of rhinitis, or again and again repeated attacks of sinusitis. They can be the chronic rhinitis, or exposure to certain antigens huh? and nasal obstruction. If there is obstruction in the nasal cavity, it can lead to chronic rhinitis. It means chronic inflammation. Whenever acute inflammation gets repeated, it will lead to chronic inflammation. Okay. Isn't it? Nasal obstruction will also lead to chronic, chronic inflammation. So, what are the causes? You will have the organisms which are chronic, like TB, syphilis, leprosy, rhinosporidiosis, and then one more organism called rhinosecteroma. And sarcoidosis can also cause chronic rhinitis. What are the types? We have the chronic simple rhinitis, then the hypertrophy, where there will be hypertrophy of the mucosa, oh, and the atrophic rhinitis. We will not go into details. This is very simple. Now, among the chronic rhinitis, we have one very important thing. It is very important, rhinosecteroma. So, rhinosecteroma is a gram-negative bacilli. So, it is a gram-negative bacilli or bacteria which is called as Klebsiella rhinosecteromatis. Okay? It can involve many things in this area. It can involve the nose, it can involve the tonsils, it can involve the pharynx. So most common involvement is rhinosecteroma, which is the primary site. Then you have the pharyngeosecteroma, laryngeosecteroma, and tonsillosecteroma. So we will be discussing the rhinosecteroma. So it is caused by gram-negative bacilli, the name of that is Klebsiella rhinosecteromatis. Okay? It causes rhinosecteroma. Rhinosecteroma, involvement of the nose. Rhino means nose, secteroma means because of the this virus. Klebsiella rhinosecteromatis. What is happening in this virus? It causes chronic infection of the mucous membrane of the nose. The first thing is it involves the diffuse involvement of the nose. Whole of the nose is involved. Diffuse thickening of the basement membrane, of the membrane of the nose. Followed by formation of nodules. First of all, there will be diffuse thickening of the mucous membrane, diffuse involvement of the mucus. Then the nodules will be formed in the nose. Nodules. Then these nodules will ulcerate. They will ulcerate and they will spread. Because of ulceration, they will spread to the surrounding structures and then your body will try to heal the lesions. How it will heal? It will try to cause fibrosis. This fibrosis, if there is fibrosis, there will be deformity of the nose. Big ulcers are there, fibrosis, fibrosis tissue is being there, so there will be deformity of the nose, obstruction in the nose. So this is the whole thing. So starting from the diffuse thickening, followed by the nodule formation, which can be in the form of polyps or nodules, and late cases, it will be ulcerated lesions, okay, which will spread to the upper lip, palate, and cheeks. So it will destroy basically the nose, it will destroy the cheeks, it will destroy the bones. Then healing will occur. So stage of healing, fibrous tissue formation, causing obstruction and deformity in the nasal cavity. So microscopically, if you take a piece from the nasal cavity of the tissue, what you will see? You will see the chronic inflammatory cells the lymphocyte, the histiocyte, the plasma cell. But there are two special types of changes which will be here. One is the Russell body. Where you find the Russell body? Russell body. Russell. Multiple myeloma. Uh, you have the high lymph. 
globules inside the blood vessel, in the blood, uh, plasma cells. So in the plasma cells, you have the Russell bodies. They are found in plasma cytochrome or multiple myeloma, but they can be found in rhinos Okay. Then you have the Mikulic cells. These are modified histiocytes. Then you have the Mikulic cells, which are the modified histiocytes. And in addition, you will have dilatation of the blood vessels and you will have the squamous metaplasia of the covering epithelium. Normally, you have this type of epithelium in the name. So, if you have the pseudostratified columnar epithelium, it will be changed into squamous metaplasia. Okay? So, these are the changes. Is it clear? Chronic inflammatory cells along with the Russell body and the Mikulic cells. So, these are the features of the rhinosacroma. So this is what you will find. So these are the Mikulic cells, the histiocytes. These are all, you know, for having foamy cytoplasm, clear, clear cytoplasm, foamy cytoplasm. What are the complications? So as I said, because of the, you know, fibrosis, it will cause obstruction of the nose, obstruction of the pharynx, and then it will cause the deformity of the nose also. And it can cause destruction of the other surrounding structures also, because of spread. It can spread. So this finishes the acute and chronic rhinitis. So coming to sinusitis, nose is finished. We cut the nose. Throw it so sinusitis. So we will be discussing in short the chronic sinusitis. The chronic sinusitis because it is important. Chronic sinusitis. What are the causes? Repeated attacks of acute rhinitis. Repeated attacks of acute sinusitis can lead to chronic sinusitis. Yeah. So, because you should prevent these attacks, otherwise it can go into the chronic sinusitis. Sinuses you know, no need to tell you. Frontal, sphenoid, other sinuses are maxillary sinuses huh? in the bones. Late and then topic. Is there fire anywhere? Fire for Saudi Arabia are you know down to chronic sinusitis and if there is tooth infection it can also spread to the bones and cause chronic sinusitis. What is the importance? It is very very important. Look, there are bones, frontal, sphenoid, maxillary. From these bones what can happen? If these bones are infected, the sinuses of the bones are infected, what can happen? Anybody? Transfer to the nasal And? The most important complication is these infections can spread through the bone into the brain, especially the frontal and the sphenoid sinuses if they are infected. Then they can also spread to the orbital cavity. So these are the two most important things. Spread to the brain, spread to the orbital cavity. Most important things. And these can sometimes be dangerous because they can lead to meningitis, brain infections, and the person can die because of this. So you don't have to take the sinusitis easily. So you have to sometimes be very cautious to give the antibiotics before it can spread. So direct spread of the infection to the orbital cavity and the intraorbital structures, direct spread of the infection to the intracranial cavity, then if the hypertrophy of the mucosa occurs because of chronic inflammation. It can block the passage of the sinuses. You know, sinuses have the passages which open. So if these are blocked, it can lead to accumulation of the mucus within the sinuses, which is known as sinus mucosy. Then, if there is chronic infection, it can lead to the formation of the pus. And pus, obstruction is there, pus fills up in the sinus. This is known as sinus empyema. So what are the complications? Spread to the orbital structures spread to the brain, hypertrophy of the mucosa leading to blockage of the sinus passage, leading to sinus empyema, which is formation of the pus and sinus mucosa, which is collection of the mucus. Is it clear? So these are the important things about the sinus. So sinusitis, chronic sinusitis, that's why I discussed because of the importance that it can spread to the brain and the orbital surface. Now coming to the tonsillitis. Again, Tonsillitis can be acute, can be chronic. Okay. Acute infection of the tonsils or chronic. So acute tonsillitis can be a part of diphtheria. Diphtheria, you know, there is an organism, cornic bacterium diphtheria. Huh? 
it can infect the tonsils also, it can cause pharyngitis also. And there is Vincent angina. Vincent angina, short, to be very short. We have a condition called trench mouth. Trench mouth. This is caused by fusiform bacteria and gram negative bacilli. This can cause necrotizing infection. That is why we call it as a trench, you know, mouth smell. So there can be necrotizing infection of the mouth along with the pharynx, along with the tonsils. So it is very dangerous. So this is called Vincent's angina. Okay. That is a granulocytic angina. This is infection of the tonsil associated with a granulocytosis. Means decrease in the levels of the WBCs. Okay. Uh, it is called like that, you know, because there is pain also, which is referred towards this. That is why it is called as angina. So chronic, again, so acute, you know, it can be part of direct acute tonsillitis or diphtheria or Vincent angina or agronomicity. And chronic can be caused again by the TB, syphilis, sacroma, and it can be non-specific. Now going forward, acute tonsillitis, very important. The most common thing is it is caused by beta hemolytic streptococcus. You have the case for beta hemolytic streptococcus, common in children and bilaterally. Most of the time it is common in children and bilaterally involved in the toxins. What are the types? Ketaral. Ketar, if you see the word ketar, ketar means the mucus membrane. You got it? Ketar. Ketaral means the mucus membrane. Follicular than the parent diabetes. So, from the word, I will try, try to understand. Petaral means involved in only the mucus membrane. Parent diabetes means the whole of the parent type of the tonsil is involved. So, more dangerous. Follicular means there are you know lymphoid follicle like things. There is lymphoid tissue in the tonsil. So, if it involves that, it is called follicular. So, petaral, mucus membrane, parent diabetes, whole of the parent diabetes. And follicular means the lymphoid tissue of the tonsil, which is involved. These are three types. No, acute catara. As I said, it is limited to the mucus membrane. It can be unilateral or bilateral, can involve both. And tonsils will be red, they will be enlarged, and they will be edematous. There will be edema of the tonsils. See, it is very simple. Yes. Then acute follicular tonsillitis. So it is suppurative inflammation of the lymphoid tissue, which is present in the tonsil. So lymphoid tissue of the tonsil is involved. So it will lead to purulent, pus-like structure inside the tonsil. And accumulation of the pus in the crypts will lead to dotted tonsils. So if you see the tonsil, they will be enlarged, but they will have yellow dots. This is roughly the pus which is inside the tonsil. Okay? I will show you the diagram. Sometimes these follicles, these you know yellow dots can coalesce with each other and there will be whole, you know, tonsil will be covered by yellow membrane, greyish white yellowish membrane. So it is called membranous tonsillitis. When only dots, you have the follicular. When whole tonsil is covered by a membrane, it is called membranous tonsillitis. Again the tonsils will be red, congested, enlarged, but they will be dotted by the pus. They will be dotted by the pus. So the picture is coming. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Membranous is different. When you have the pus formation dots, when these